Okay. Uh, I just want to say, firstly, thank you all for taking time out this evening to uh, attend this webinar. Um, I really appreciate it. I know that it's, everyone's very busy and takes a lot of time out of your day. All right, I'm going to start covering a lot of information very, very quickly, so hopefully I won't, won't lose you, but we need to connect a lot of puzzle pieces here. Uh, and uh, the first place I want to start is with shale and Wall Street, and, and the Wall Street, the large Wall Street investment banking role in um, the shales to date. Excuse me. Um, essentially, what the banks did was they used the same playbook that they had used with mortgage-backed securities uh, with shales. This time, instead of holding the toxic assets on their own books, they transferred them and left them, or and or left them on the books of the actual shale companies, but the, the playbook was essentially the same. And you may recall in the lead up to the mortgage-backed securities crisis, uh, several things happened. They, um, they guided the ratings agencies, they uh, bundled mortgages, and um, they engaged in a lot of off-balance sheet financing, which makes it very difficult for an investor to really get a good picture of what's happening with a company. Um, and they essentially did the same thing with shales. Um, they bundled, in this case, they bundled leases rather than mortgages, um, drilled a handful of wells in, in a few, um, at the very beginning, and then announced that the entire play was, um, would be homogeneous, and um, then they would flip these plays for multiples. Aubrey McClendon made a great comment to financial analysts a few years back stating, uh, I can assure you that uh, selling, flipping leases essentially for five to ten times what we paid for them is a lot more lucrative than trying to drill gas at five to six dollars in MCF. But um, essentially what they did was they, the, the analysts at the investment banks put pressure on the companies to continue this increased production. And the increased production in turn drove prices down. Now, uh, a lot in the industry, and, and I have stated that this is more of a conspiracy theory, but it's not. It's very simple math, actually. You could um, extrapolate out, if you were in, in investment banking, you could extrapolate out anywhere from 12 to 24 months where the price of natural gas was going to go. And, and this is essentially the formula that you would use. You would take the existing production number, and then you would add on to it your production targets. Now these production targets are one of the primary metrics that oil and gas companies use and analysts and investors use for that matter uh, to determine the health of, of an oil and gas company. They expect to see year over year growth in production. And so if you combine the existing production numbers with what you think the companies will do, and, and most of them will come very close if, if not absolutely on target for this because it is one of the primary metrics and if they don't reach this number um, their stock will be downgraded. So you can, you can pretty much rely on um, the existing production plus the production target uh, coming in at, at where you think it will come in and that gives you some significant number. You can then look at that significant number and subtract current demand and in this case demand was about one quarter of the supply. And so you knew, looking out 12 to 24 months as a banker, that there was going to be a considerable surplus of natural gas that was going to hit the market. And part of this is because shale gas wells, as Richard very um, succinctly said, they, they produce the most oil or gas they're ever going to produce very early on in their lives. And then they, uh, the decline curve kicks in, usually around 12 to 18 months out, and they plummet after that. So you, you could see that there was going to be a considerable surplus, and a surplus equals one thing, and that's a glut. And glut means prices will go in one direction and one direction, direction only, and that's down. But what this did, the, the doors that were opened by this decline in natural gas prices for the investment banks were that they could um, begin to generate quite significant fees in mergers and acquisition deals. Um, and this next slide should show you how, that, uh, how the banks fared in this. 
if you look in 2008, the total value of mergers and acquisitions in shales was only about 15 billion. And uh, as you can see on the red line up there, the price of natural gas was trading an average at about $8. It did go up to close to 14, but it averaged $8 that year. As that price started to decline precipitously, and uh, part of that was due to overproduction and part of it was due to the economic decline. Uh, but as you can see, as that price started to decline precipitously, the value of those um, mergers and acquisitions in unconventional gas and oil, for that matter, uh, just went through the roof. It jumped from 15 billion to 50 billion in one year. Um, and as you can see, it went 38 billion in 2010, 47 billion in 2011. And my slide needs to be updated now. It hit about 52 billion again in 2012, and then it plunged. And I'm going to go into that in just a moment. Uh, but the monies are indeed drying up for shales. Now, do I have a problem with this? No, of course not. Investment banks are there to provide a, a good financial service, which is needed in a healthy, for healthy economic reasons. The problem that I have with these particular deals in shales is that within a matter of months, literally within a matter of months, the deal started to go south on investors. And so there has been significant shareholder destruction. And um, these write downs um, are, well, my favorite one here is BHP Billiton. BHP is an Australian multinational and they went in and they bought um, uh, all of Chesapeake's Fayetteville assets. And they paid about $4 billion in total for them. A mere 18 months later, BHP had to write off over 50% of the Fayetteville total assets purchased for about $2.84 billion. And this has been across the board. In Canada, $1.7 billion, BP, $2.1 billion. You can now add into this slide um, Exxon and Shell. They have both taken over $2 billion in write-downs on their shale assets. It was very interesting. Uh, Peter Vosser is stepping down as CEO of Shell. And about a month or so ago, he gave an interview to the Financial Times of London in which he stated that the biggest mistake he made uh, in, during his tenure as CEO at Shell was to invest in North American shale assets. They have now taken, as of last quarter, a $2 billion write-down in shale, and they've announced that they're going to sell off over 50% of their assets, uh, North American assets. Now, you would think, listening to industry, that um, shales are supposed to be the energy panacea, et cetera, for us. And yet, if you go in and you look at free cash flow uh, and you look at, at um, what, what's actually left at the end of the day, how much money is left for these companies at the end of the day, you would think that they would be making money hand over fist, but they're not. CapEx uh, up there at the top of the slide simply means capital expenditure. So, this is the amount of monies that these shale companies, whether they be oil or gas, in, in shale oil or tight oil, I mean uh, shale gas or tight oil, um, it's the amount of monies that they've spent to drill and complete wells, essentially. Now, the reason I use free cash flow is, and, and I want to make a distinction here, this isn't, I'm not talking about cash flow, I'm talking about free cash flow. And the reason I use it is that you can do all sorts of weird and wonderful accounting tricks um, with, with earnings, um, with cash flow. Uh, you can massage numbers, manipulate numbers, and make them come out to look much better than they really are. Free cash flow, on the other hand, it, that is a very difficult number to massage or manipulate. And so I and an, a lot of other analysts like to go in and have a quick look at free cash flow. It's one of the first things I ever do when I look at a company. Um, to see what is the actual health of a company. And it's very interesting. Um, this is a slide that I put together looking at uh, just five companies. Um, and I, I wanted to take companies that were um, all onshore. They didn't have anything other than shale assets, whether they be oil or gas. And um, I wanted to look and see over a, a, a relatively long period of time, a three-year uh, window of time, what their cash flow had looked like compared to their capital expenditure. Now, um, the top part, the red in this slide, is actually the capital expenditure. So as you can see, uh, for the most part, if you, you take Chesapeake off, which is the first company in that, on this slide, to the left, 
uh, because Chesapeake's an absolute mess, as we all know. But if you look at the other four companies, uh, you'll see that capital expenditure was growing quite robustly between 2010 and 2012. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, the blue, that's actually the, the free cash flow. Now, businesses operate exactly like families. Um, if you're talking about free cash flow, you're talking about after I've paid all my bills, how much money do I have left? That's your free cash flow number. And as you can see, there's been a significant deterioration between 2010, 2011, and again 2012 across the board. What's interesting about the Chesapeake numbers is that between 2011 and 2012, Chesapeake sold off about uh, $15 billion in assets, but their free cash flow deteriorated even further. Now, what's interesting about this pattern is that this isn't just these five companies. Uh, we have since gone in and pulled the free cash flow numbers on 20 different shale operators, all of the names that you would um, readily recognize if I were to name them off, all 20 of them, here tonight. And we see the exact same pattern across the board without exception, without exception in all 20 companies. So there's clearly a problem generating cash uh, in spite of this explosion in capital expenditure. Um, so that speaks significantly to the underlying health, um, financial health of these companies. Now let's go in and look at some of the fundamentals behind fraconomics. I truly wish I'd coined that phrase, but I can't take credit for it. That actually came out of the Financial Times of London. 